Linda Audio Books presents this unabridged recording of Tomorrow When the War Began, written by John Marsden and read by Susie Doherty. Be sure to visit our website on www.bolinda.com. Details of other available and forthcoming Bolinda audiobook releases can be found at the end of this recording. And now, here is your narrator, Susie Doherty, with Tomorrow When the War Began. The book begins with a dedication to my dear sister, Robin Farron, so much admired. Acknowledgements. I'm grateful to Charlotte Austin, Frank Austin, Ross Matlock, Jeanne Marsden, Ruse Marsden, Catherine Maxwell, Sarah Vicker Willis, and Scott Vicker Willis for providing some ideas, information, and stories used in this book. Chapter One. It's only half an hour since someone, Robin, I think, said we should write everything down. And it's only 29 minutes since I got chosen. And for those 29 minutes, I've had everyone crowded around me, gazing at the blank page and yelling ideas and advice. Rack off, guys. I'll never get this done. I haven't got a clue where to start and I can't concentrate with all this noise. Okay, that's better. I told them to give me some peace and Homer backed me up, so at last they've gone and I can think straight. I don't know if I'll be able to do this. I might as well say so now. I know why they chose me, because I'm meant to be the best writer. But there's a bit more to it than just being able to write. There's a few little things that can get in the way. Little things like feelings, emotions. Well, we'll come to that later. Maybe. We'll have to wait and see. I'm down at the creek now, sitting on a fallen tree. Nice tree. Not an old, rotten one that's been eaten by witchetty grubs, but a young one with a smooth, reddish trunk and the leaves still showing some green. It's hard to tell why it fell. It looks so healthy. But maybe it grew too close to the creek. It's good here. This pool's only about ten metres by three, but it's surprisingly deep, up to your waist in the middle. There's constant little concentric ripples from insects touching it as they skim across the surface. I wonder where they sleep and when. I wonder if they close their eyes when they sleep. I wonder what their names are. Busy, anonymous, sleepless insects. To be honest, I'm only writing about the pool to avoid doing what I'm meant to be doing. That's like Chris, finding ways to avoid doing things he doesn't want to do. See, I'm not holding back. I warned them I wouldn't. I hope Chris doesn't mind my being chosen to do this instead of him, because he is really a good writer. He did look a bit hurt, a bit jealous even. But he hasn't been in this from the start, so it wouldn't have worked. Well, I'd better stop biting my tongue and start biting the bullet. There's only one way to do this, and that's to tell it in order. Chronological order. I know writing it down is important to us. That's why we all got so excited when Robin suggested it. It's terribly, terribly important. Recording what we've done in words on paper. It's got to be our way of telling ourselves that we mean something, that we matter, that the things that we've done have made a difference. I don't know how big a difference, but a difference. Writing it down means we might be remembered, and by God that matters to us. None of us wants to end up as a pile of dead white bones, unnoticed, unknown, and worst of all, with no one knowing or appreciating the risks we've run. That makes me think that I should be writing this like a history book, in very serious language, all formal. But I can't do that. Everyone's got their own way, and this is mine. If they don't like my way, they'll have to find someone else. Okay, better do it then. It all began when... They're funny, those words. Everyone uses them without thinking what they mean. When does anything begin? With everyone, it begins when you're born. Or before that, when your parents got married. Or before that, when your parents were born. Or when your ancestors colonized the place. Or when humans came squishing out of the mud and slime, dropped off their flippers and fins, and started to walk. But all the same, all that aside, for what's happened to us, there was quite a definite beginning. So, it all began when Cory and I said we wanted to go bush, go feral for a few days over Christmas holidays. It was just one of those stupid things. Ah, oh, wouldn't it be great if... We camped out quite often. We've been doing it since we were kids, taking motorbikes all loaded with gear and going down to the river, sleeping under the stars, 
or slinging a bit of canvas between two trees on cold nights. So we were used to that. Sometimes another friend would come along, Robin or Fee usually. Never boys. At that age, you think boys have as much personality as coat hangers, and you don't notice their looks. Then you grow up. Well, there we were, only weeks ago, though I can hardly believe it, lying in front of the television watching some junk and talking about the holidays. Corrie said, We haven't been down to the river for ages. Let's do that. Okay. Hey, let's ask Dad if we can have the Land Rover. Okay. Hey, let's see if Kevin and Homer want to come. God, yeah, boys, but we'd never be allowed. I reckon we might. It's worth a try. Okay. Hey, if we get the Land Rover, let's go further. Wouldn't it be great if we could go right up to Taylor's and into hell? Yeah, okay, let's ask. Taylor's. Taylor's stitch is a long line and a rate that goes dead straight from Mount Martin to Wobegonu. It's rocky and very narrow and steep in places, but you can walk along it and there's a bit of cover. The views are fantastic. You can drive almost up onto it at one point near Mount Martin on an old logging track that's hard to find now. It's so overgrown. Hill is what's on the other side of Taylor's. A cauldron of boulders and trees and blackberries and feral dogs and wombats and undergrowth. It's a wild place, and I didn't know anyone had been there, though I'd stood on the edge and looked down at it quite often. For one thing, I couldn't see how you'd get in there. The cliffs all around it are spectacular, hundreds of meters high in places. There's a series of small cliffs called Satan's Steps that drop into it, but believe me, if these are steps, the Great Wall of China is our back fence. If there was any access, the cliffs had to be the way, and I'd always wanted to give it a go. The locals all told stories about the hermit from hell, an ex-murderer who was supposed to have lived up there for years. He was meant to have killed his own wife and child. I wanted to believe in his existence, but I found it a bit difficult. My brain kept asking myself awkward questions like, how come he didn't get hung like they did to murderers in those days? Still, it was a good story, and I hoped it was true. Well, not the murderer's part, but the hermit part at least. Anyway, the whole thing, the trip, grew from there. We made this casual decision to do it, and we immediately let ourselves in for a lot of hard work. The first job was to persuade our mums and dads to let us go. It's not that they don't trust us, but, as Dad said, it's a pretty big ask. They spent a lot of time saying no, but trying to talk us into other things instead. That's the way most parents operate, I think. They don't like to start a fight, so they suggest alternatives that they think they can say yes to, and they hope you might say yes to. Why don't you go down to the river again? Why don't you ask Robin and Miriam instead of the boys? Why don't you just take the bikes, or even the horses, make it a real old-fashioned camp out? That'd be fun. Mum's idea of fun was making jam for the preserve section of the Wirra Wee show, so she was hardly an authority on the subject. I feel a bit odd writing things like that, considering what we've all been through, but I'm going to be honest, not mushy. Finally, we came to an agreement, and it wasn't too bad considering. We could take the Land Rover, but I was the only one allowed to drive it, even though Kevin had his peas and I didn't. But Dad knows I'm a good driver. We could go to the top of Taylor's Stitch. We could invite the boys, but we had to have more people, at least six and up to eight. That was because Mum and Dad thought there was less chance of an orgy if there were more people. Not that they'd admit that was the reason. They said it was to do with safety. But I know them too well. And yes, I've written that O in no carefully. I wouldn't want it to be confused with an E. We had to promise not to take grog and smokes, and we had to promise that the boys wouldn't. It made me wonder about the way adults turn growing up into such a complicated process. They expect you to be always on the lookout for a chance to do something wild. Sometimes they even put ideas into your head. I don't think we would have been bothered to take any grog or smokes anyway. Too expensive for one thing. We were all pretty broke after Christmas. But the funny thing is that when our parents thought we were doing something wild, we never were. And when they thought we were being innocent, we were usually up to something. They never gave me a hard time about the school play rehearsals, for instance. But I spent all my time there with Steve undoing each other's buttons and buckles, then frantically doing them up again when Mr. Cassis started bellowing, Steve? Ellie? Are they at it again? Someone, get me a crowbar! Very humorous guy, Mr. Casser. 
we ended up with a list of eight